Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I get the uh, enjoyment of introducing our next speaker. Just kidding, I'm the next speaker. Uh, my name is Jay Jacobs. I am a data scientist. And as a way of a bio, uh, I put up a bunch of pictures. And basically, I've been doing a lot of research into security, a lot of visualizations. In the upper left, I spent several years working on the Verizon DBIR. Uh, in the lower left, a book called Data Driven Security that I wrote with Bob Rudis. It's been out for a few years now. Uh, in the top middle, we've been doing work with Kenna Security, talking about prioritization of prediction, and we're analyzing a ton of vulnerability data. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about some of those visuals here. Uh, Vericode in the upper right, looking at application security uh, and all of the code scanning that they do. So there's a lot of data, a lot of visualizations. And what I hope to do is to uh, try and convey some of the core concepts of visualization so that uh, anybody out there can work with any software, even Excel, to create better than average visualizations. And really that's what we're aiming for, right? Just better than average here. Just trying to up the game a little bit. So as a, a fun sort of introduction, uh, I want to go back several years. Um, I actually got a data set from a guy who stood up, uh, from Daniel Blander, he stood up a bunch of instances in AWS data centers around the world and he turned on the network interface and captured packets. And he did this for about six weeks and he gave me this enormous data dump and said, what happened? What are we seeing here? And so I wanted to take, that, take advantage of that and create an animation. And so this is one of the first cool things that you can do with, with especially with time-based data. If you treat it like stop motion, like claymation, right, you can create individual plots, save them in a directory, and put those together like claymation. So what I did is I took five minute chunks and I said, all right, let's look up the source IP, what country is that coming from, and what data center is it going to? So I created this visual. And each ball is a five minute chunk, the size is the number of packets, and I essentially it took me a lot longer to create these files and to create these images than what it does in real time. But I essentially went through, created this going across. And all I did was write a script to do this. And it's just going across, it's going to town. And I also created bars. If you notice on the two sides, there's bars saying where's things coming from, how many are there coming, bars on the right, where are they going to? And remember, these are just cloud instances. Just stood up, just turned on the interface and started capturing. Now something really interesting happened Sunday morning. And um, I, essentially I created this. I had no idea what was in the data. And then Sunday morning rolls around and something really strange happens. And usually I talk a little bit slower, so by this time it's at Sunday morning. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> So what we're gonna see, Sunday morning, I think 8, 8 a.m., if you watch Vietnam on the bottom, there, 8 a.m., you start to see this massive spew of packets coming out of Vietnam. And this is a really slow scan. Remember, each of those little balls is a five minute period. This goes on for roughly 40 hours, and then it abruptly stops. And so this got me wondering, what is going on? Like this is, to understand what's actually going on, this is a terrible visualization. But it gives you an indication that something is going on, right? So I created this. I broke out the source countries, and I put TCP on the right, UDP on the left. I tried to show the top 200 ports that were being hit. And this is a few years ago, so you see like, 1433 being constantly hit. Does anybody know what that is offhand? What? What? I couldn't understand. SQL? Uh, and then you also see MySQL there. You see RDP 3389. You see a lot of those lower ports, Telnet, SSH, FTP, port 80, uh, 135 there lighting up. But now watch as we get to Sunday morning again. 
and watch what happens. Another thing with this view, you see port scans is like lines of balls going across. And you'll see it a little bit more on the, on the UDP side. Um, but you can also see, like, this is just, they're just nailing these ports over and over again. And I remember back in the day, we'd talk about firewall rules, and let's just open these up for like a half hour while we do this one thing. Let's just open it to the internet for a half hour. And so visualization, visualization like this would really help say, no, 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 we're not going to open it up for a half hour. All right. All right, so we're getting to about Sunday morning. Here comes Vietnam scanning like this. And I thought that was cool. Uh, that's really cool. And then I couldn't fit all the ports, so now it's hitting this other category at the bottom. And then at the end, they just scan two ports over and over and over again. Now, I have no idea what's going on there, right? But a week later, I decided to, to look a week later, see what happens again on Sunday morning, because I was watching this. This is actually like an eight-minute movie, um, and it gets really boring. But if uh, I was watching it and I noticed another scan coming, s not Sunday, a little bit later, but watch the UDP stuff too. You see these like wall of scans coming across like that. There's that scan again coming across, hits this other port and stays on other. But then something else really weird happened. I was creating this and the whole screen went blue for a bit and I couldn't figure out what happened. So I changed the size of the balls to try and figure out what happened. And that happened. I have no idea what that is. It came out of Germany. Uh, if you could read the port, you could see what it is. So basically at this point, that was the height of my talk because everything else is gonna be static from here on out. Um, but part of what I wanted to say here is that animation is just it's super fun. Usually when I make animations like this, I start uh, you know, maybe in the afternoon, and then by like 4 a.m., I realize it's 4 a.m., and that I'm still almost done tweaking these, these things. So it's a really fun practice to, to play with that. All right, but DataViz can be super simple. So this is a plot uh, that just has a single line on it. And this is actually looking across 300 companies and their vulnerability scans, scans from their vulnerability scanner over months and months and months, saying how long does it take an average vulnerability, how long does it survive, right? And this is using data analysis technique called uh, survival analysis or time to event, time to failure, all the same stuff under the covers. But essentially, look at how simple this is. It's a line, right, it has two axes, and I put some annotations on there to try and communicate messages. So you can see in that first one, 25% of vulnerabilities are remediated within four weeks. Half of them are remediated in the first 100 days. And then you can start thinking about your SLAs. You get some sort of high SEV vulnerability or non-high SEV, what's your SLA for it? And so using this, this plot, I wanna cover what we're gonna talk about today. There's three big things I wanna talk about. The first thing is the data. This plot has two variables. It has the percentage of vulnerabilities being remediated. It's a continuous variable. Uh, it has a range between zero and one. And then the bottom one is time, also a continuous one. Time can also be uh, a category, because you might have months or something like that, but. We're also gonna talk about visual cues. In this plot, we've got a line, which you can think of as a point in motion. We're using color a little bit here. The line is actually blue. Uh, and then we've got position on a common scale. Those scales are gonna create a visual cue that we'll, we'll cover. And lastly, I'm gonna talk about those scales and coordinate systems. All right, let's get into the data. So there, there are two types of data as, a, as big generalizations. Okay, there's gonna be quantitative or continuous count data. And that's gonna be things like uh, if you're measuring bandwidth, if you're counting vulnerabilities, counting attacks, counting types of attacks, uh, looking at loss amounts, anything that has some sort of number, some sort of counting associated with it, it's gonna be a continuous or quantitative variable. Then you've got categorical or discrete data. And this is gonna be categories, buckets, uh, any lists, could be ordered, um, could have inheritance, so like an IP address, even though it's a number, it could be represented numerically, do not treat it 
as a number. This is one of the first things that people kind of screw up with when they're dealing with this. Um, malware family itself is a category. It might be related to a larger family, it might be a variant. Uh, CWEs, uh, that also has an inheritance to it, uh, but it's a category. Um, things like that, things that you can put into a category. So let's take a look at some plots here. So this is looking, um, again, through kind of security, we're able to see how, how fast companies can remediate. So I created two quantitative variables. You know, the, the, the horizontal here is looking at the average open vulnerabilities per month, and then the vertical is looking at another quantitative variable, how many closed per month, right? And now the insight here is looking across this whole distribution. And what's really cool is that these things cluster about 10%. So we can see by plotting it like this, we can see that on average companies are able to remediate about 10% of their open vulnerabilities per month. So when you get people who say, why don't companies just patch everything? Why don't they just fix everything? Look at this, this is over 300 companies, right? And you get up into that upper right, you are talking well over a million, 10 million vulnerabilities that some of these vulnerability scanners are finding. This is a really, really tough problem. The other thing to note is the scale. And I'm gonna try and nail this point home for everybody. This is a log scale. And I remember starting out and people would say, don't use a log scale, it's not intuitive, right? It's nobody can actually think in terms of a log scale. And that's somewhat true. I've gotten pretty used to dealing with log scales, but the data itself is in a log space, okay? You cannot view this in a linear thing, and I'll have some examples on that later on. Let's talk about some data here. We did a survey where we talk to CISOs and security leadership and we talk to board level executives and we ask them various questions about security topics and how much they want to hear about that. And then we ask them, what do they actually get? So, we've got three quantitative things here. We've got what the CISO said, what the board says, and what they actually get, right? And then the bars here are encoding, it's a visual cue, we're encoding those quantities separated by color, and position is going to group those together. But the content here is super interesting. If you look at that second one, risk posture, the board really wants to hear about risk. The CISOs and the security leadership really don't want to tell them about risk, because it's a really tough topic. Uh, and they're getting more than the CISOs want to give, but less than what the board wants with that gray bar. Look at the one above it, system vulnerabilities. They both want more than what they're getting, right? And so this is a very simple visualization, just some bars, grouped, colored, showing length on the same scale, and you can communicate a whole lot of information in there. Let's take a look at another one. This is from Fortinet. Uh, this is called a heat map because when you look at it, you can see hotspots, right? Uh, and you can see this is essentially botnet families detected across regions and the prevalence of customers in that region seeing this type of botnet. And you can see Andromeda, for example, is very different. It's sticking out, out of here. Otherwise, there's not a whole lot of difference across region. And that's another thing that you can pick out of these plots. You might look for something and say, hey, we don't actually see anything here. There's nothing actually interesting there. Now, this is another one where we're dealing with categorical variables that have an order to them. We're actually showing ranking here, and we, I, I don't know if this one has an official name, but we call it a worm chart, because it seems like things worm through it. But essentially, we've got two different data sources here. This is mainly from Veracode. And so we were dealing with the OWASP top 10, uh, looking at vulnerabilities and source code, and that's that first column, the flaw prevalence. So you can see uh, like data exposure, uh, injection failures, auth failures, those are at the top. And then with the Verico data, we we're able to also look at the fix rate, how fast are developers going after these types of things. And you can see some shifts going on there. You can see the logging jumped from the bottom to the top, but it's super hard uh, when you're doing code scanning to detect a lack of logging, 
right? Because you might be scanning something that shouldn't be logging. So to detect something that doesn't exist is really hard, which is why it's on the bottom in the first column. But then um, uh, with the F5, went through exploit DB and looked at all of the exploits in exploit DB and said, what are these going after? What are the OWASP top 10 that they're targeting? And that's that third column. And then the fourth column, F5 shared the, the types of incidents and the root causes that they found in the incidents that they were investigating. And then you see the incidents there. So you can see things like auth, top of the incidents, third in the flaw prevalence, second in the fix rate, lower in the exploits, but it's at the top of the incidents again. But you can just follow these. And so you've got a, a category that has an order, right? All of these four, th four categories have a rank in the OWASP top 10, and the colors are encoding that rank. Or I mean, the, it's encoding the OWASP top 10. So you can track the rank across these different categories. And now this one, this one's called a waffle plot, um, mainly because it looks like waffles. Uh, but at the top, essentially, um, working with uh, Kenna, we're looking at all of the CVEs, right, these published CVEs. At the time I pulled the data, there were 108,000, I think there's 130,000 now or something. Uh, but essentially, out of all of those CVEs, we looked across uh, 300 plus environments, found that about 37,000 CVEs were seen or reported in these environments. So if you're gonna tackle CVEs, it's a great news because maybe you don't have to look at 108,000, you can just focus on 37,000. But then out of those 37,000, only about 5,000 of those have been exploited or have exploits available in the wild. And so you can immediately see this funnel effect and so we're looking at a whole lot of stuff down to a lesser amount, down to a lesser amount. And part of the reason for a waffle chart is that this is trying to convey using area. I'm gonna talk about area, but it's a very confusing way and it's not a very accurate way to communicate things, but the waffle chart breaking up into boxes helps that make it a little bit easier. All right, I touched on this a little bit, um, but getting to know distributions is a really, really important part of working with data. So one of, the, one of the first things we always do when we get a new data set is that we simply explore it. We just visualize, we take individual variables and visualize it. If it's a, a categorical variable, we'll count the categories. If it's a continuous variable, we'll create something like this. Either the bottom one is called a density plot. Uh, the thing above it is a box plot. We'll try to get a feel for what is the range, what does it spread, what does it look like, that sort of thing. Because in security, uh, you're gonna have a lot of these logarithmic data sets. And so this is from Akamai. Uh, Martin McKay did a great job on this. And what this is showing, is showing DDoS attacks and over a week period. So each vertical is a bunch of DDoS attacks during that week and then the size of those attacks, right? So if we think of that data, it's uh, continuous. We're talking about bandwidth here, uh, sustained bandwidth over time. And then we've got a time element across the horizontal. Uh, and then we've got the, the coloring here showing a density across that. And in order to try and hit this point home, there's lines going across here. The, the black one is showing the median, the middle. So 50% of the attacks are bigger, 50% are smaller. So if you're trying to think, what, how much protection should I buy for DDoS? Uh, what is a typical DDoS attack? You can't really say, oh, the typical DDoS attack, attack is you know, one gig per second because it's, it's not. I mean, like you might, some companies might see less than 100, some might see more than 100 gig, right? And so trying to convey that distribution is incredibly important, right? And so I think this does a really, really excellent job though, showing all this data over time. And again, we're dealing with a logarithmic scale here because that's what the data does. All right, let's talk about visual cues. And this is mainly what you use to encode. Um, we could be talking about uh, position. I talked about position on the common scale, using length, uh, using direction or slope and lines, comparing lines, talking about angles and areas, which you'll see in pie charts, uh, and then down into density of a single color, saturation of a color, and then finally color hue, colors of the rainbow. Now in order to figure out what we're gonna use for visual cues, we have to first understand that data visualization is a communication process, 
right? Like any communication process, uh, there needs to be a message, and that message is gonna be the data. And we have to encode that for transmission, right? I'm up here, I'm encoding my message into words. The medium is speaking it through the air. The message is received and hopefully decoded by everybody, and then hopefully that message that is decoded matches what I, the, the sender was sending. And so with visualizations, we have to understand that right side first. We have to understand when people see a visualization, how do they decode it? How does the brain work? How do eyes perceive this, right? And there's been a lot of studying on this, especially in the last five years. It's been really exciting for data visualization. But essentially, we're gonna use those things. We're gonna use position, length, the size, color, shape, so on and so forth, to try and communicate, encode our message, and how we do that is gonna be dependent on how people decode it. So if we talk about quantitative variables, and we want people to look at something and translate it back to that quantity, this is a rough ordering of the, the success, the accuracy of somebody decoding a quantity. So if we're using position on a common scale, for example, we've got a scatter plot, very small. People are, are generally very accurate with that. You slide down into direction, slope, angle, area becomes a little less accurate, uh, a little more confusing to try and compare areas. You get down into density, uh, even color hue, it gets really hard to get back to that original quantity. Now, when we look at different types of data, we're gonna have different things jump out. So when we get to categorical, for example, all three of these have position across the top, but some of these things shift around. So if we're dealing with ordinal data, we may be able to use like density or saturation, whereas I'll be very poor when you're talking about a quantitative variable. So let's take an example here. Let's go back to that capacity chart. Take these two points. Because they're on a common scale uh, and they're, they're points, they're really easy to compare, right? You can look at those two points and say the one towards the right definitely has more open per month, but they're closing roughly the same. It's pretty easy to see the one on the left is slightly higher, right? You can be very, very accurate in decoding that quantity. So this type of thing is really nice for encoding. Take a look at this one again. Uh, the, the positional grouping, I'm using the, the group here to say all of these three visual elements make up this category. And then because they're on the same scale, on the same horizontal scale, you can very easily compare which one is longer. And in this case, you can say by how much, how much longer, right? You get a ratio. Back to this one, you see that we're using that, uh, the, the color because it's ordinal. Um, we're putting it visually in a position that's in order, and then we're using color to track the category going across. Now, if you notice back in this chart, area is very, very low. And area is the primary visual cue when dealing with pie charts. And if people have been around data viz people, a lot of them get really uppity about pie charts and say, don't use pie charts, they're terrible. Um, I'm in the middle, but, but here's why. Here's why people say don't use them. Take this pie chart and, in, and sort it largest to smallest. Okay, all right, wait, if you're having problems here, I'll try to make it a little easier. Does this help? <laughs> Is that good? All right, but take a look, take a look at this one and take a look at um, C and F. Which one is bigger? Now look at C and F. This is drastically different, right? This is the same exact data, same exact representation, but you get C and F and C and F. Because you're tilting it, you're trying to create a perception, things closer have to be bigger, things further away have to be smaller, and area is the primary way we interpret pie charts. Now I'm gonna take the same data and I'm gonna encode it slightly differently. Tell me, sort it now. Can you tell which one has more quantity and less quantity? It becomes way easier, right? You're on a common scale. And it even became easier because I actually sorted it visually for you, right? Let's take a look at saturation. That is essentially a single color making it lighter or darker across a spectrum. 
Uh, and a lot of times you see these on maps. This is a choropleth. And so this is looking at, I think, population, yeah, population and logarithmic numbers by world countries, 2013. So but try to compare any country to another, right? And you might be able to do it if they're next to each other. You can say this is, has more population than that one, but try to compare two in two different areas of the map. Try to, try to pick out any quantity at all. Like you, the scale is absolutely worthless. Like what is the population of the US here? It's like a medium blue. You know, that's about the best you can do here. Here's another one where you got saturation coding and quantity as a count of IP origins and an active botnet. Um, and again, this is a count of something in security that grows exponentially. This should be on a log scale. That's why you have one country that is extremely dark and everything else is extremely light. This is working in a log space. It should be in a log space. Here is a map where they used um, diverging color scale using color hue to try and show the least cyber safe countries. Now you could be able to pick out blue from red. You can pick out the extremes, right? But take a look at some of those yellow countries. I don't even know on what side of the middle that falls. Right, the middle is like a beige. Where in that color spectrum is yellow? It becomes very difficult. Right, this is very difficult to pick out a quantity having to do anything with either color hue or color saturation. So try to avoid doing that. People get around this though by putting these in buckets. So changing that categorical or a quantitative variable into a category. You can do that a little bit. So if you search for maps like this, a lot of them will try and do that. All right, so again, this is sort of the scale. This is something that you want to follow. Try to, to um, adhere to this as you're trying to decide what to use in your visual cues. I'm trying to stall because there's cameras up. Okay, um, scales and coordinates. So I'm gonna try explaining something because there's a hard time that I had early on dealing with data. And that is uh, in algebra you're taught when you mess with one side, you have to mess with the other, right? If you multiply by two on one side, you have to multiply two on the other. Everything has to be in balance, right? When we're talking about data and visualizing data, that kind of falls out. And it's not even, like they're not even in the same realm. We're not talking about algebra, we're talking about data. So if you take this data that I plotted here on the X and Y axis, we can transform, say, the X axis, right? If I go between those two, those plots, the points didn't shift at all. We're transforming the data, right? We can do that with the Y axis. Again, the data doesn't shift, right? Just the, the value is shifting. And so we can do that. We can do that, we'll do that for certain models, uh, algorithms, things like that. Uh, clustering often wants you to scale things like that. Um, so this is transforming the data, but maintaining that same visual relationship. Now another thing is what you can also change the visual coordinate system, but keep the data. So this is basic data, zero through five. We can put this on a log scale. This is where I'm gonna harp on the log scale bed. So this doesn't look very good. It pushes things in the upper left. But I wanna take a plot. This is taken, we're, we have a, a report coming out where we're looking at uh, breach frequency and losses. And one of the things that we're gonna take on is this whole notion of cost per record because it is absolute garbage. The cost per record is worse than useless, okay? So this is a, a plot of the number of records in a breach and the, uh, was it, the, the losses reported on the vertical. Do you guys, can you see a trend here? Is a trend coming out? This is on a linear scale. Zero's in the corner and it goes up. The bottom, the number of records goes up by 200 million increments. Do you see a pattern? Anything jumping out? Let me put both of these on a log scale. Now we start to see some trends, right? This is in the log space. So first thing, you might see some vertical lines on the right one. That's because when people report number of records, they go, a thousand, right? They round things off. So you see these vertical striations of records 
Um, not so much on the loss. The actual, the loss data here was taken from court records and various reports and things like that. Not somebody saying, eh, it's about a million dollars in losses, right? We're not seeing it on that aspect. But we do see it on the number of records. Um, but you can also see that this is not a, a straight linear relationship. Um, if we build a model on this, it's going to be a log log model. Uh, so any sort of uh, simple cost per record metric is going to greatly underestimate the costs of a small one and greatly overestimate costs of a large breach. And so this is not going to be a way to approach this. You can't just simply say $200 per record. All right, so this is on a log scale. And I've already talked about this chart being on a log scale, um, talking about vulnerabilities, and this grows exponentially. Um, and then back to this chart. I think this is so fantastic talking about the log scale because I mean you could take any one of these weeks and visualize them as a distribution and you're going to see this beautiful sort of symmetric uh, hump essentially. Um, and so looking at it across time we're going to see shifts and ebbs and flows but those smoothing lines take that across and I think it's just fantastic. All right. The takeaways that I hope people uh, uh, take away. So understand the data first. I talked about this notion of exploratory data analysis. Um, there was a great uh, uh, guy in the 70s that pioneered uh, exploratory data analysis. He wrote a book on it, uh, really nice. He didn't have the advantage of Python or R at the time. Um, so some of the visuals are a little bit simple, but you can still find functions in today's code that are doing what he wrote about in the 70s, which is really great. Um, and so understand what the data is and also look at relationships. Creating simple scatter plots can be a really, really powerful tool. Uh, and don't be afraid to use bar charts. I think probably 80% of the things that I'll do is a, a bar chart. Um, and just understand the difference between categorical, continuous variables, uh, ordinal data, things like that. Just understand what that's going to be before you try and visualize it. And then talking about visual cues again, trying to understand as you talk about uh, shape, size, color, position, things like that, they all have meaning to people reading it and trying to take that in. And so understanding that is going to be really important. And then scales and coordinates, get used to log scales. This industry has so much stuff in log space, it's crazy. Um, so I highly recommend just trying to understand it, uh, looking at long tail data like that, and there's just so much of that out there. So with that, I will open it up for questions, and thank you for your time, everyone. Yes, sir. It, it, his name is John Tukey, T-U-K-E-Y. Um, but there's been, there's quite a few books right now. If you search Amazon for data visualization, there's a ton of really good books out there. Um, Nathan Yao. What? Yeah, Cairo, Albert Cairo has just came out with another great book about data visualizations and lies. Albert Cairo? C A I R O. Yes, sir. Uh, so you talked about a lot about visualizing data. How do you think about visualizing causation? Do we think these things led to this? Causation. So the question is, what, how, how do you talk about causation and, and visualizing causation? So causation. Um, there's a, there's a guy by the name of Judea Pearl who has been studying causation in. Uh, data analysis, things like that, and, and I, I've been trying to get through his book, but it's really dry. I'm sorry for the streamer people if I've been, I know, it's pretty dry. Um, but essentially, a lot of the statistics and data analysis that we have right now um, does not deal with causation. It's all correlation, basically. And when we get to causation, it's because people look at it and apply their expertise and say, of course, a comes before B, right? Um, and so a lot of that causation comes that way. But once you start to get that relationship, basically you could think of it as uh, inheritance or an order or something like that. So, you know, you think of like uh, the attack framework, you get, or, or the um, kill chain, you get these things happen, you know. Um, so you think of like a graph type system or something where you get this order to it. Jay, do you have any favorite open security uh, sets, data sets that people can play with? 
Oh boy, any, any good open data sets to play with? Um, the, the question was are there any good open data sets to play with, uh, to play around with? Um, and there are, and I'm trying to think of, uh, it's like secrepo.com. What's that? S E C R E P O dot com. Did I get that right? I hope that's right. Um, but that has a lot of data sets out there. Um, did that work? Okay. Yeah, sec repo. Um, there's a lot of data sets there. But I think a lot of this stuff, I mean, like if you're at a company, just start collecting stuff and hopefully you get permission uh, or ask people for data. Um, I find that if you just ask, the, the biggest, hardest thing in any sort of data analysis project is getting the data. That is by far the hardest thing. Uh, analyzing it, visualizing it, that's, you know, that'll take time, you can do it, but getting the data is always the hardest thing. But if you ask, you start asking around, you, you should be able to get something, right? And a lot of people will try to anonymize it, make it safe, things like that. And that's fine, take what you get and work with what you got. So. Yes, sir. Time, yeah, so we've collected data on time to remediate, and we do have data on time to exploit, but it's super hard when you're talking about vulnerabilities, because essentially you can look, there's two main sources of being, three, three main sources of exploitation with vulnerabilities. One, somebody will publish code, which isn't technically exploiting anything, but the code is out there. And that's a, you can get that date really solid. Uh, but then there is uh, malware, reverse engineering malware that says this vulnerability is used in this malware and hopefully you can trace back dates on that. But then the third one is IDS and IPS systems. And so the challenge there is that you can, you, you can, we have a bunch of IDS, IPS data that we use, and you'll see a first date, but then the question is, when was the signature generated that would capture that, right? And a lot of the companies that, that we've been working with basically say, oh, we don't track that. You know, or we throw it in there, or a lot of these are automatically generated. There's 100, 150 of them for this one CVE. Um, and we can tell you the last time it was updated, but we don't know exactly when, you know, so some of these things aren't being tracked and they're really hard to get that specific date of when it was first attacked. But, I mean, like that, to me, that's one of those golden areas to study because that's how we're gonna talk about the disclosure debate, right? Let's look at the effect of different disclosure methods when they're exploited, do we see any correlation between different disclosure techniques and the amount of exploitation and the speed of exploitation? At this point, I have no idea, right? So we're seeing it, how do we measure that better and how do we start to address it from, from through science? So. Yes, sir. The animations, um, you can do anything. Um, I used R. I do everything I, everything I do is in a language called R, uh, which is r-project.org. Um, it's, a, it's a language developed by statisticians uh, to, to do data analysis, but a lot of people use Python, which is a development language that got applied to statistics, um, so it's a lot more general purpose, and they're both fabulous, and they both have really great visualization libraries. I'm not gonna promote one over the other, but I do do R all the time. Um, and so with that, that animation, it's just creating a plot and saving it off. Um, and I think I used like FFmpeg or something in a command line just to take like, you know, thousands of images in a directory and turn that into a, a movie. So it's a really fun technique. Yeah. You mentioned the cost of records being not a particularly valuable, valuable metric. Right. the ones you do see as valuable. So we're going to publish something on that. Um, there's, a, there's, there's so many complexities talking about the losses from a, a breach, um, and there's a huge variation. So like to say, hey, it's gonna be, you know, hey, if you had this breach, it's gonna be uh, 1.2 million. Like that is absurd. It's gonna be like, oh, you had this breach? Well, it's gonna be somewhere between 500,000 and 300 million, you know? Um, that's, I mean, like that's what the data is gonna be able to allow us to say. We can say we might expect it to be here, it will never be there, but it'll be around here, right? Um, and so it's gonna be some type of model like that. And it's gonna be 
having to get okay with uncertainty like that because that's exactly what the world is. So. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone.